Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the April 11th edition of the Connect Online Meeting. It is so very good to be with you here tonight. Of course, I'm your host this evening, Jonathan Jenkins. You probably know my name by now, but if you're not, don't know it, it's right there on the screen, so you can read it. Uh, my co-host, Eric Owens, is not here with us tonight. He's going to be gone pretty much the entire week. Um, he is up in Michigan with a uh, meeting up there that lasts through Thursday evening, so uh, he's going to be on the road, I think, uh, or in the air, I'm not sure if he drove or if he flew. Probably, probably flew going from Georgia to Michigan. I guess he flew, uh, but he'll be traveling back home on Friday, so we will be without him pretty much all week long. Uh, wish him well in that meeting. Saw some pictures from that on um, Facebook this this morning, even. So I know he's doing a good job, and thank the good brethren up there for inviting him to be a part of it. So uh, we will miss him, but we will uh, carry on in his absence. Um, Tonight we have Brian Kenyon with us, and we'll get to Brian here in just a moment. But while we are getting started this evening, if you would, please take a second and uh, make sure you are subscribed to uh, all of our social media platforms. Uh, currently, we are streaming to a couple of different Facebook pages. We stream on YouTube. We also stream over our Twitter account, and we also stream on Rumble. So uh, check all of those uh, links if you would. And make sure you are following us. If you're on those platforms, make sure you're following us on them. We'd appreciate it. Uh, the links to those platforms, uh, the addresses to those platforms that we're on uh, can be found in the description of the video that you're watching. Um, if you would also, uh, please take a second and like the video, hit that notification button, all the stuff that social media loves. And one last thing, please make sure you share the video tonight. Uh, sharing the video is the best way that we, uh, we know of to keep trying to expand the audience here at Digital Bible Study and get new people exposed to the, uh, the wonderful gospel teaching that goes on here throughout the day and especially for the Connect meeting uh, four nights a week here on uh, Digital Bible Study. So if you would, we'd appreciate it. Secondly, if you'd like to help us out here. Now, I haven't said this in a few weeks, I don't think, but Digital Bible Study is not a church work. We don't solicit money from churches. We don't go around trying to raise money from them. This is, it's two guys and a webcam. Uh, it's Eric and I, and we just try to keep it running as best we can on our own. So we need your help. Uh, so if you'd like to support the work here at Digital Bible Study, you can do that uh, with the stars and the super chats on Facebook if you're on either of those platforms. Or you can do it, uh, maybe the best way is just subscribe to our website, digitalbiblestudy.org. You can do that for as little as $5 a month. We'd appreciate it. Uh, it is your generosity and your uh, belief in this work that helps us keep the lights on and keeps us uh, being able to invite guys back night after night after night. And we do uh, we do thoroughly appreciate and uh, are grateful uh, for the way that you help us out, um, well, every, every week, every month that you're here. We do appreciate it. Uh, we will say a prayer at the end of the evening tonight, and if you have any prayer requests, just drop those into the comment section. I'll try to follow along as best I can, and we'll uh, uh, address those in the at the end of the prayer. At the end, at, at the excuse me, at the end of the evening rather. Um, and you know, it doesn't matter if it's a, a health request or if you just want to give praise to God for something. Uh, just put it in. We'll we'll take all comers when it comes to uh, uh, praying to God on your behalf. So uh, feel free to do that and make uh, make use of that if it is a uh, something that you would find benefit in. Having said all that, let's turn our attention to our speaker. Uh, I was telling Brian in the in the pre-show before we turned the thing turned the cameras on and went live, I can't believe we haven't had, in 400 nights, we have not had Brian Kenyon on. Um, Brian is uh, well deserving of, of having been here a lot earlier than he is. Uh, we've had a lot of the people that work with him on uh, over at the Florida School of Preaching, uh, but we never got the head honcho on, but we got it tonight, so we're looking forward to it. Uh, known Brian for a lot of years. Um, I don't know that we've spent a lot of time in each other's presence, but uh, I've seen him every year for a lot of years, back when Fried Hardeman actually had an open forum, uh, really saying some wonderful things at the open forum. I always appreciated when he got up and said something, because usually I was wanting that to be said, and I agreed with him, and I was just hoping somebody would stand up and say it. Uh, but uh, uh, Brian has been just a, a, a great soldier of the cross for a lot of years. It's done great work down there at the Florida School of Preaching, uh, and we're, we're honored to have you tonight here, Brian. Uh, good to see you, man. How you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Good great. to see you, and thanks for having me on the show. I don't know about that head honcho stuff, but anyway, I do the best <laughs> I can here. But uh, we appreciate your good work and appreciate all the brethren uh, here. I know I've, I've listened to some of these and uh, very good material. And we appreciate what you do in the kingdom. Well, thank you, thank you for that, Brian. Uh, obviously, I mentioned you're over at the uh, Florida School of Preaching, and I, I know we've had well Hiram on before he left. I think we had Terrence Dindy on, um, and we've had Joshua Cantrell on. I, we may have had somebody else from over there as well. I can't remember who all we've had, but we've had. So our, our members or our, our viewers, or at least the regular viewers, are at least familiar with the work over there, but. Uh, 
tell us a little bit about, well, first of all, tell us about yourself, your family, your background, all that stuff you want to, but obviously we'd like to hear more about the work over there at the School of Preaching. Just take a couple minutes and, and tell us what's on your heart, what's on your mind tonight. Okay, well, I've been working with the School of Preaching since 1996, and that's a lot of years. It's hard to believe it's been that long, over 25 um many of you know i lost my wife in 2010 who was a big part of the work here and uh remarried in 2012 and so uh i've got a lot of experience in that area but god has been always good to me and uh, i just consider myself a servant of his and what come what may i'm just going to serve him now uh, at the school uh, unfortunately we are one of the best kept secrets in the brotherhood we're trying to you know get away from that secret stuff but uh, we are outside the Bible Belt, so to speak, and so a lot of people don't know that we're here, but we've been here since 1969. I am the third director uh, in those over 50 years of school here, graduates all over the world, and uh, we've, we've done a lot, of, uh, a lot of things in Florida that may be behind the scenes, brotherhood-wide, but I just wrote an article for our monthly publication about uh, kind of our history and the kind of the things we've had to face, but you know, in Florida, we had the non-institutional thing movement kind of really sprung up in Temple Terrace, which is not too far from here. Uh, the Boston Crossroads movement, uh, other things that have gone on. But we've we stayed the course here and we have prevented a lot of a lot of damage, further damage than what there could have been. Uh, we do have classes. We have uh, like most of preaching schools. We have lots of classes, 10 classes a week. And uh, we have a two semester program. And of course, every single one of our classes are available online. You would just simply go to www.fsop.net and there's a place where you can register for those and you can be uh, sent a link and you can take those classes for credit. You can take those for auditing just to learn more about the Bible. Uh, we have a monthly publication that we'd be happy to send to anyone free of charge. Uh, we can do that electronically or paper copies. Uh, you just let us know uh, on that website. You can just go through the website and let us know. Give us your email address or give us your mailing address. We'd be happy to give those to you. And they have a teaching article in them as well as keeping up news with the school. But we are excited about our expansion. Uh, of course, COVID made a lot of us have to do a lot of online things. We still prefer in-person. and We're still an in-person school with online capabilities rather than an online school with in-person capabilities. Uh, but we, we, we uh, would enjoy you taking our classes and they are free of charge. Uh, just have to buy the textbook is it. And we do charge a $5 registration fee just for incidentals and office expenses like that. And that's for the whole semester, not, not for each class, but the whole semester, whether you take one class or 10, but we'd love to hear from you. Sure would. Absolutely. You know, Brian, I don't know that unless you live in Florida, because, you know, it's in the southeast. You, you mentioned it's outside the Bible Belt. Once you get once you get south of about Lake City, I mean, you know, it's not, you know, certainly south of Orlando. Uh, I don't know that people appreciate East Coast or West Coast. If you're on the West Coast. And I'm over here on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can count the number of vibrant. You know, there's a lot of small 30 and 40 member churches around here. But yes. You know what, what uh, established churches like like over in Naples or you know Palm Beach Lakes where my dad is that 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 would be comparable to churches in 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 Nashville or, or Atlanta or something like that. I mean they're they're about as rare as hen's teeth in Florida. It, it's it is not. It's it's the what the third most populous state in the country, and we do not have the church is not very strong, and particularly central to South Florida. I don't know that people realize that. Yeah, that is very correct. In fact, uh, we're dealing with a couple congregations in our area that are about ready to shut the doors. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the motivation behind my lesson tonight. Uh, don't turn back. I mean, we've been through some very difficult times, um, but some people they're 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 you know, I don't know that they're going to survive the COVID. All of us know of businesses that haven't survived it. And mm -hmm. there's some congregations that are on the brink of shutting their doors. And we don't want that. Even though they've said, you know, hey, if we ever sell our building and all that, we're going to give the money to the Florida School of Preaching. We would much rather have strong congregations in the area than have the money that we would get from their building. I mean, that's just the way it is. I mean, we're the stronger the church is, the better off the Florida School of Preaching is. And so uh, we, we just can't give up, man. We got to dig in. And I'm really excited about some of the things I've been hearing through the COVID. In fact, uh, 
I was just really pumped up and I went to the Connect Conference in Nashville. It was hosted by the Creve Hall Congregation back in June of 2021. And uh, I'm just really excited about it. there seems to be a, a I, I call it kind of a great awakening, reawakening or something like that. A lot of evangelism mm -hmm. schools popping up, preaching schools popping up, um, you know, Rob Whitaker's evangelism seminars and workshops that he's been doing. All that stuff I see is a good thing that people I think are starting to wake up that, hey, man, it takes work to keep the church going, to convert souls. And we've just been, generally speaking, especially in central to South Florida, we've just been sitting around waiting for it to happen. But we got to get involved and we've got to got to get motivated and, and, and reach souls and build the church because, you know, these cities in, in Florida, like you're talking about, Jonathan, they, they are populated cities. There, there's a there's a whole host of potential members of the church there. But these congregations are a small 30, 40 shriveling up, about ready to close their doors. And we, we've got to we got to change that. We got to change that. Yeah, I live in Brevard County, which is about a million and a half people um, of churches that I would consider viable and sound. Uh, there's a uh, predominantly black congregation and then there's the Rockledge congregation. And that's about it. Uh, yeah. And Rockledge, we, we were running. I go to Rockledge and we were running 160, 170 before the pandemic. We're lucky to have 100 now. Uh, right. And uh, the predominantly black congregation was probably 75, 80. And I, I, I don't have exact numbers from them, but I've heard it's that they've been struggling. Um, yeah. So we, we need some help down here and uh, we need sports schools like the Florida School of Preaching. But we didn't come here to just spend all the time talking about that. We came here to hear you preach. So uh, okay. you mentioned your lesson title. Uh, don't turn back. Um, you want to give us a little wet, wet our appetites here a little bit before we get started? Yes. This lesson is basically uh, when we compare the situation that we're going through with the COVID. And of course we live in the state of Florida, right? And the free state of Florida, I might add. And so we don't have nearly the restrictions and things like that, that other states have and other, other places have, but yet we've allowed that COVID to really bog us down and, and, and uh, kind of bring the church down small. But uh, anyway, you know, that what we've been through is really nothing. Is, I mean, it's, it's, it's something, but it's like, the, the apostles, you know, when Jesus was crucified, when he was taken away from them and not just taken away, but violently taken away from them, uh, that was a pretty tragic, challenging event in their time. And so this lesson is going to come from John chapter 21, where Peter and some others said, let's just go back to fishing as if they were going to give up on, on what they had been called to do. And uh, but yet there's some lessons in here from verses one through eight that we're going to look at tonight. Uh, three three main points of the lesson we'll look at tonight under the heading, Don't Turn Back. And we will use the example of Peter and these uh, six other apostles uh, and, and the things that we can observe from that text that we can apply to our situation that would motivate us and get us not to turn back. Don't turn back. Keep going. And uh, that's what the lesson will be about tonight. Uh, brother, we are looking forward to it. Uh, the rest of the time is yours. And so I will turn the room over to you. So uh, just go ahead and uh, start preaching whenever you are ready, sir. The room's okay, yours. Okay, my brother. Appreciate it. All right. As I mentioned in John chapter 21 is where our text will come tonight. And so if you do have a ribbon marker or a paper marker in your Bible, please uh, open up to that chapter verses one through eight and put that ribbon marker in there. We will look at some other passages of scripture, but this will be our main text. Now, before we get into the text, well, actually, let me just go ahead and read the text in verse, chapter 21, uh, verses 1 through 8. And I'll be reading from the New King James translation. And here uh, the text reads, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Uh, and in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan in, Ga in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said uh, to him, we are going with you also. Uh, they went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. And when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast a net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast the net and were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. 
Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Then Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord. He put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea. The other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 200 cubits dragging the net with them. And so in this basic text, we see Peter, and Peter, this is not the first time he's involved in an incident like this. In fact, we can almost, in one sense, bookend the life of Peter as a fisher of men between this similar fishing situation. Uh, for example, in Luke chapter five, when he was first called to become a fisher of men, we have a very similar situation. Uh, it was here in, in Luke chapter five, verses one through 11. We have a similar occasion where Peter uh, was involved and uh, he and his, his partners went out fishing and they were out all night. They didn't catch a thing. And when they came to shore, Jesus saw them cleaning up their nets and, you know, packing up their things after a long night of fishing with nothing. And uh, he told them to cast the net into the water. Of course, in Luke chapter five, uh, Peter pro protested a little bit by saying, you know, we've been fishing all night, haven't caught a thing. And now you say, just throw in our net. And so they did throw in their net. The sons of Zebedee did. We're partners with them, it says. And they caught so many fish that uh, it ripped the nets and they, they, they had to, to, to drag and had to do some things to get the fish out. Uh, but then Jesus said to them uh, at the end of that, he said, um, you know, I will make you fishers of men, he says uh, in uh, chapter five in Luke chapter five. Uh, do not be afraid of, uh, at the end of verse 10, he says, do not be afraid for now you will catch men or be fishers of men, as the older translations say. Well, that's a similar setting. And so he was kind of called to be an apostle there in that setting. And, uh, and he went through his apostleship as he's going through uh, accompanying Jesus, as Jesus accompanied him. And uh, throughout his ministry, of course, Peter had his ups and downs and all of this. And then chapter before, the two chapters before, John chapter 21, uh, of course, Jesus is crucified in chapter 19 and uh, the events of that. And he, of course, he rose from the dead and the women came to the tomb first. And, uh, you know, it should have been no surprise that, that Jesus would have been in Galilee. And of course, when we go back to our text in John chapter 21, after these things, Jesus showed himself again. And again, to these things, he had already shown himself to Thomas. And uh, this event here in chapter 21 is later referred to as his third appearance to them. And uh, so, so Jesus had been crucified. He had risen from the dead. And Jesus told them back in Matthew 26, 32, that he would go before them into Galilee. And then also when the women came at the tomb, the angels told them, go quickly and tell his disciples that, you, that he has risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And so uh, Jesus said that he would meet them in Galilee after the crucifixion and after he had risen from the dead. But when we get to John chapter 21, it does not seem like they were expecting him. And this is very common. Uh, the two disciples on the Emmaus Road, if you remember, in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 31, they did not expect to see Jesus. And he had joined them as they walked back to Emmaus and conversed with them. And even Mary in the garden very early uh, when she was leaving the tomb, Jesus met her. And uh, remember, she thought uh, the text says that she thought he was the gardener. And so in all these cases, they were so bummed out, they were so shell-shocked, if you will, that they had forgotten about Jesus' words. They had forgotten about his promise of resurrection. And, you know, I think if we put ourselves in that position when something tragic happens to us or we perceive it as being tragic, you know, we forget things. We, 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 we lose things in, in our mind, and, and, and we are very similarly uh, acting as they were. But uh, nonetheless... Uh, Jesus appears to them. Now, when when uh, and we're going to get to our three points here in just a moment, but when when uh, Peter says uh, in verse three, I go fishing. And uh, the other said to him, we are going with you also. 
uh, you know, some take that as, as, as Peter just, you know, going back to work. Uh, after all, he's been walking with the Lord for three and a half years or so, and he needs to get back to feed his family and all this kind of thing. And so some take a view like that. I do not. I think the text, the context itself, uh, indicates that Peter was not expecting Jesus. That when Peter says, I go fishing, it's almost like he's saying, well, Jesus is gone. It was a great ride while it lasted, but now it's over. We might as well get back to what we were doing before. And that, 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 that is the case when you look at the context here, because, you know, if, if, if that wasn't the case, then they would have expected to see Jesus. Uh, when they saw Jesus, it would not have been such a surprise. But they are really surprised when it's Jesus, when they realize that it's Jesus, so surprised that Peter, you know, jumps in the water to, to go to shore to meet him uh, just very quickly. And so, um, you know, I think Peter was going to get back to fishing and he was going to go back just to his normal life. And that's kind of what happens when, you know, we accomplish some great thing. And you just think in our lives, I know in my life, and I've seen it in the lives of others, that we set a goal and, and we reach that goal and then we have a big letdown. Or maybe on the way to that goal, things are going great and some tragedy happens and then there's a big letdown. And, uh, but the, 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 and, and there's not anything wrong necessarily with the letdown, but it's the stay down that we want to avoid. Letdowns are one thing, but stay downs are something else. And so Peter and these six others who went fishing, they were in danger of the stay down. But uh, Jesus and, and the lesson we'll look at here in just a moment should motivate us, I hope, and we'll give some practical application at the end as well, should motivate us not to quit. Don't turn back now. Keep going. Don't turn back now. And so uh, the Sea of Tiberias, of course, is another, another name for the Sea of Galilee. Uh, we know this from John 6 and verse 1. And uh, Jesus, again, called Peter as a fisherman back in Luke chapter 5, a fisher of men. And uh, this event, he seemed to have forgotten that. Now, one thing before we get into our main points tonight is that our decisions and the things that we do will influence others as well. And so when Peter said, I'm going fishing, they also said, we are going with you also. And so they followed Peter into fishing uh, at this moment. He influenced them to go back to fishing. And Peter, uh, of course, later, you know, in the book of Acts, he's a very prominent figure in the church. And uh, I think in the book of Acts, he learned some lessons from his denial and so forth. And then in First and Second Peter, as he writes those epistles much later than this, he's learned a whole lot, especially as it deals with persecution. And so he was very influential among the apostles. And we, especially those of us who are preachers, those of us who are elders, uh, I also am an elder. I did not mention that in the uh, introduction part, but I was added to the eldership here at South Florida Avenue uh, on March 29th, 2020. And that, that was actually uh, the second Sunday that most congregations closed down and went to live streaming. And so that was, you know, my introduction to the eldership all through COVID. But, uh, you know, by the grace of God, we're coming out of COVID down here and our numbers are starting to build back up again. But the point is, is we have an influence and we, we know that, um, uh, but this is just a reminder of that. And those who maybe, you know, maybe not preachers, maybe not elders, but uh, strong church members and, and those uh, important parts of the body of Christ. Uh, we need to realize that we may not think that we are an eye or an ear uh, to use Paul's terminology in First Corinthians 12. But we also have an influence on people. And I would suspect that the kind of church members that are listening to this podcast uh, they are the, the type of members that, that do have an influence. And so do not underestimate that. And the things that we decide and the things that we do will impact others. But when we get to our lesson here, don't turn back. Uh, Peter and the apostles needed to learn the same three points. And they did, obviously, <coughs> the same three points we will have tonight. Don't turn back. We must not turn back, number one, because Jesus is the same. Jesus is the same as he's always been. Uh, Hebrews 13 and verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That was the same Jesus that was that, that, that Peter met in John or Luke chapter 5. That same Jesus that called Jesus or called Peter to be a fisher of men is that same Jesus who's standing on the shore uh, here in John 21. And that same Jesus that we serve, he's been the same. All our lives. He's been the same before we were even born. He's been the same 
before creation. You know, Jesus is the same. He, he is he is he does not change. Um, he is God in the flesh. He has always been God in the flesh, you know, even before creation in the mind of God. And then the incarnation and that word incarnation, carnation is flesh, carnate. So in flesh, in the flesh, Jesus is God. He became God and he came in the flesh. Uh, we are familiar with John chapter one and verse one. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And that word was in there. It's very significant in John chapter one, verse one. Uh, in the original language, it's called imperfect tense, which refers to continuous action in past time. Uh, and that past time relative to the writer of things of, in the Bible, not well, for sure, our past time as well. And so when when John takes, you know, that word back to the beginning in the beginning was he's saying that that word existed continuously before the beginning. And uh, the word was with God. So wherever God was, the word was with God continuously in the past. And the word was God. So whatever, whatever God was in the past, the word was. And we know that that word is Jesus because in John 1, 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And so Jesus is God. He came in the flesh, he died in the flesh, he was raised from the dead, and he now sits at the right hand of God. And that resurrection, by the way, confirmed his deity, Romans chapter 1 and verse 4. In our past lectureship, and that's another work of the School of Preaching, we have a lectureship every third, it begins every third Monday in January, which is the uh, Martin Luther King Day. Of course, our lectureship had been going on long before they made that a holiday, but that's a very good way to remember it. But that lectureship last last well, just a few months ago in January was on uh, the the um, power of his resurrection, the power of his resurrection and the resurrection of Jesus is a significant event. I'm just going to remind you of that. I know you know that, but that that seals the deal for any skeptic, for anybody that uh, does not believe that God exists and that the Bible is the inspired word of God, the resurrection nails it. There is no way that anybody can rationally examine the evidence of the resurrection and not come away knowing that Jesus rose from the dead and that since he rose from the dead, again, as Romans 1, 4 states and other places, he is the son of God with power. And uh, that resurrection is awesome. But Jesus is the same. He is the same Jesus that resurrected and sits at the right hand of God is the same Jesus that was with Peter in Luke chapter 5. And he's the same Jesus that has been there at God's right hand. The same God that's been with us all through the pandemic. And if we just look back in our lives, I mentioned my wife passed away in 2010. And Jesus was there, that same Jesus. And uh, if it were not for him, I could not have endured. In fact, like Job and like others who have been through that and like many listening here, uh, my faith was strengthened. I had greater faith at the end of all that than I had at the beginning of that. And that's a whole nother lesson by itself. But Jesus is the same. He rose from the dead and he will never leave us nor forsake us. And that's a very, very comforting verse in Hebrews 13 and verse five. Of course, he says there, let your conduct be uh, without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And we have to remember that when, when times are tough, when we think about quitting, when we think about turning back, we have to remember that verse, I will not leave you nor forsake you. And even when antagonists are involved in flesh and blood, verse six goes on to say of Hebrews 13, for we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And so Jesus is the same and uh, he will deliver us. He will see us through trial. Sometimes he'll see us through. Sometimes he'll deliver us, but we can trust in him. And uh, no matter what we go through, even the pandemic, don't turn back because Jesus is the same. And uh, I usually, if there's older uh, people in the audience, I'll, and of course I'm one of those, look at my head, 
but we can look back on our lives, especially even younger people, but especially us older people, we can look back and see events that happened in our life that we could see no way out. But yet here we are today. God delivered us and we made it through by his grace. And so even now he will do the same. Uh, in first, second Corinthians chapter one, great verse there. We won't turn to it, but in first Corinthians chapter one, after he gives all that, all, all those passages about comfort verses nine through 11, Paul refers to that event that befell him in Asia where he saw no way out, but yet God who raises the dead delivered him and he delivered him in the past. He delivered him in the present. And Paul says, even in verse 11, that he will deliver him in the future. And that's the God we serve. So don't turn back because Jesus is the same. Secondly, don't turn back because the mission is still the same. The mission is still the same. When we look at Peter's life here in John 21, his, his, you know, his statement, I go back to fishing. It seemed like, and of course, again, he had just been through a very tragic event with his friend, Jesus, his master, his teacher being violently taken away. But it seems as if he was just he was acting as if Jesus's call for him to be a fisher of men was only while Jesus was there with them uh, on the earth. Well, that's not the case. When Jesus called him to be a fisher of men in Luke chapter five, that meant from here on out, from there for the rest of his life as an apostle, as and he, he was an apostle the whole rest of his life, uh, that his whole life was to be involved in catching or being a fisher of men. And uh, he seemed to have forgotten that. Peter did in John chapter 21. Now, when Jesus, of course, he hung on the cross and, and John chapter 19, just a few pages over in my Bible, he utter, uttered those words, it is finished, and he gave up his spirit. Well, that it is finished was not the end of Jesus's ministry, period, but that it is finished is talking about his sacrifice his blood sacrifice on that cross for our redemption. But when you open up the book of Acts in Acts chapter one and verse one, of course, uh, Luke gives that similar introduction as he does uh, in the book of Luke, the former treaties I made of Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Notice Jesus began to do and to teach. Well, Jesus didn't finish doing and teaching. He's still doing and teaching but he does it through the church and acts will go on to show that the whole book of acts, but he began um, both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after uh, through the Holy spirit, he gave commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he presented himself uh, alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so he still teaches. He still teaches things pertaining to the kingdom of God, only he does it through the church. And he did it through the apostles, through the book of Acts. And those, you know, those others, uh, the church, we, and we see the progression of Acts. I know we're familiar with that. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, they were going to be witnesses in Ju Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so that wasn't just while Jesus was alive. And we are Christians, those of us who are Christians, our, our commitment to Christ is not just while things are going well, but it also includes the times when things are not going well. And we work our way, we have to work our way through them. But the mission is still the same. Uh, and that mission, first and foremost, is to glorify God, is to glorify God. Now, Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 7 and of course, uh, you know, Isaiah is a tremendous prophet and Isaiah speaks. And what's what's so awesome about him is he lives during the Assyrian period of domination. And so he prophesies about that in the end of the Assyrians. He also prophesies about uh, the next kingdom to come, which is Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, as if he's right there. And then he also prophesies about the Medo-Persian Empire, even mentioning Cyrus by name way, way decades, decades before he's even known about. Uh, and, uh, and and Isaiah prophesies about this just as if he is here. He was there. But, uh, and of course, that's easy to do when you are writing by the inspiration of God. But anyway, um, 
he writes in Isaiah 43, 7, there's a messianic section there. And he is, he is writing about the people of Israel, the remnant of Israel that he has called by, the, by name. But he says there in Isaiah 43, 7, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. And again, he's he's talking about that remnant, but he's using the imagery of creation of man. And he is saying everyone who is called by my name. And so the everyone there directly was referring to that remnant. But, you know, figurative language takes it from takes it from literal, takes the meaning from literal things to make the figurative make any sense. And so we can say, and of course, it's inherent in verses like Genesis 1, 26 and 27, that I've made him in my image or let us make man in our image after our likeness. And he created them, male and female, he created them. And so every human is an image bearer of God, which, you know, entails the purpose that we have is to glorify God. But yet when we sin, you know, as Paul says in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so the purpose that God had for us in creating us is, taken out is diminished it is it is it has failed when we sin and so to glorify god we have to have that sin removed and that's what the blood of jesus christ does uh, as we uh, obey the gospel uh, and we'll say have more to say about that in just a moment as well but that's how we can glorify god once again and so the mission is to glorify god uh and and of course we will get into being fishers of men and stuff but i want to point out here i mentioned in the introduction to this that uh, in Lakeland, Florida, we've had to deal with since our inception, uh, non-institutional doctrines and matters of expediency and judgment and these kinds of things that some have taken and made into God's law as if they were God's law. And so we have dealt with that quite a bit. And we've also dealt with uh, the Boston Crossroads movement, who has now evolved into the International Churches of Christ, a denomination uh, but it began uh, in, in our backyard almost about two and a half hours uh, north of here uh, is where it all began. But uh, I say all that to say that, um, you know, there, especially the Boston Crossroad, their number one goal in life was to disciple, to make disciples. And uh, that's a very lofty goal. But when it's done in a way that does not glorify God, that does not really make true disciples, uh, it's a skewed goal. But if we put first to glorify God, then we will win souls the right way. But we have to glorify God. That has to be our first and foremost goal is to glorify God. Now, in 1 Corinthians uh, 10 and verse 31, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, uh, Paul writes there, uh, whether you drink or whether you eat, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, in that Romans uh, or that 1 Corinthians 10, 31, he is concluding that section that covers chapters 8, 9, and 10 of 1 Corinthians that really deal with eating meat sacrificed to idols. And in chapter 8, you know, uh, he says there's no such thing as an idol. Uh, it's a mute point. However, if, it, if, if eating that meat causes my brother to stumble, I'll be a vegetarian the rest of my life. Uh, and then chapter 9 is all about just because we have a right to do something doesn't mean we have to do it. And he gives several examples in there. And of course, it all goes back to eating meat. Just because I have a right to eat meat doesn't mean I have to. There are some things we can forego. And some key passages in there are verses, uh, you know, 19 through 20, 23, where he talks about, I become all things to all men that I might win some to Christ. You know, just because I have a right to do something doesn't mean we have to do it. And then in chapter 10, he gets into more, more things about, you know, eating meat as a matter of judgment and drinking certain things. And it kind of, corresponds to Romans chapter 14 as well, uh, that 10th chapter. Uh, and so when he says, you know, whatever we eat or whatever we drink or whatever we do, he's talking about those things that are expedient and, and, and things like that, that aren't inherently sinful, but can be the way we use them. But he's saying all of that doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, it matters, but the overriding factor is we must glorify God. And so whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do all, we must glorify God. Now, how do we glorify God? Well, another passage that's very good here is Colossians 3.17. Paul writes there, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by or through him. Now, think of that verse. You know, 
whatsoever you do, what does that leave out? Not a thing. Whatsoever you do in word or deed. Well, what does that leave out? Not a thing. Somebody might say, well, what about your thoughts? Well, your thoughts eventually come out in your words and in your deeds. And so that would include that. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all. You know, what does that leave out? Do all. Not a thing. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have to have Bible authority, Jesus' authority for everything we do. Not just in worship, not just in preaching, but everything we do in life, we have to have God's authority. And so that's how we're going to glorify God by Colossians 3.17, applying that principle there. And uh, again, you know, some things are matters of obligation. Some things are matters of judgment. Some things are optional. Some things are required by God. And we do have to study God's word, uh, rightly handle the right, the word of truth, 2 Timothy uh, 2.15. And we have to do those things in order to, to ascertain what is pleasing to God. But glorifying God is the number one part of our mission to glorify God. And then part of that glory, part of that mission as well, once we are glorifying God and we've determined to do that, we do have to live the gospel. We have to live what Jesus said. And, um, you know, we have to remember what Jesus said. And again, even when when tragedy happens and I often think about this. And of course, the tragedy you know, with Peter, I'm thinking back on Peter. Um, he had forgotten those things that Jesus said he'd meet him in Galilee, that Jesus was supposed to die. Like he said, he was going to rise from the dead and he was going to meet with them again, again in Galilee. But uh, he forgot. Sometimes we forget these things as well, but we must keep them first and foremost, live the gospel. And I often think about Joseph, the patriarch, when he was confronted by Potiphar's wife there in Genesis 39. You know, when that happened, he didn't say, oh, time out. Let me go. Let me go pray. Let me go study the Bible and then I'll give you an answer. But uh, Joseph had trained himself throughout his life to. To automatically, you know, when something happens, be faithful. And so he immediately could could say, no, I refuse. And then day after day, after she pestered him, he could day after day say, no, I refuse. And I think that speaks well of him. And that has to be our mindset. We have to be so ingrained in God's word that when events do happen, it's just second nature for us to think about principles, think about passages and and, and make the right decision and not not uh, yield into temptation. But living the gospel is very important. But in order to live the gospel, we have to get it in us. And this is why it's so important to study, so important to practice, to put into practice things uh, that we learn from Scripture. And our faith can never outrun our knowledge of God's word. Romans 10, 17. And so we have to be able to live the gospel. And of course, in living the gospel, uh, you know, we are to be the salt of the earth and light of the world, as Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter five, verses 13 through 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. And so that's one thing that we have to do as, as we live the gospel. And then uh, part of that mission as well. And then we finally get to being fishers of men. You know, we have to have the mindset, I'm going to glorify God no matter what. And our roles are different as well in the church. I mean, some are young mothers. Uh, they need to stay with their babies. Uh, some of us are preachers. Our role's a little bit different. Some of us work a secular job, and we can be a light in that secular job. But we have a different role in the church, and that's, that's great. That's fine. Uh, but all of us can shine our light where we are, and we can be an important part of bringing souls to Christ. And so our mission is is the same. We must not turn back. And so even though we're on the, this side of COVID, we've got to, and I, I hear this a lot, man, and I hear it. In fact, and I don't know how anybody feels about this. I'm just going to put it out there. It is a matter of judgment, whether we have, you know, a morning service and an evening service. It is a trend in places to have uh, put everything in the morning and leave the evenings free. And I can understand that. In fact, some were doing that way before COVID came along especially in rural areas uh, that I know of out in the sticks of Texas and elsewhere. But uh, congregations that have decided to do that because of COVID, I often question that judgment. Uh, there's congregation near here that were known. They were known for having about 80 to 90 percent of their Sunday morning attendance come back at night. They were known for that all the way up until COVID. 
And then toward the end of COVID, they decided to do away with their evening service. Now, again, it's, you know, it's not sinful. It's a matter of judgment. But if you've been having some of the evening services we've been having here in the last about two or three months, why would anybody want to shut that down? I mean, we got great singing. We got great preaching. We got people responding to the invitation. We've had baptism just last night. I got a brother. Uh, well, he's a brother now, but he responded to the invitation last night and he was baptized into Christ. And, you know, when you take away a Sunday night service like that, why would you want to do that? And again, I know the congregation here at South Florida Avenue, we're different. Uh, we're uh, autonomous and our circumstance is not the same as others. I understand that. And so that's no problem. But when you have something good going, why do away with that? Because of gas prices? Well, why don't we leave that decision to, to the members? Um, but when el and the eldership decides, we're just going to cut that out. And we're telling the members, we don't think it's worth your time. We don't think it's worth your gas money to come at night. And again, I'm not speaking for everybody because uh, we're all different. But I'm thinking like, wow, why, why cut out a good thing like that? But our mission is still the same. And so when deciding those things, what's the best for the community? What's the best for the gospel, for the spread of Christ? And not just so I can have more time on my hands necessarily. But again, it's a judgment matter. But don't turn back because Jesus is the same. The mission is the same. And then thirdly, the outcome. The outcome is the same. The outcome is the same. When we look at Peter, in John 21, he was told to throw in his net now, in John 21, Peter did not protest like he did back in Luke chapter 5. He just did what Jesus said and had the same result. Uh, in John 21, didn't talk about the net ripping, but it did talk about it. it was too heavy to bring it up. In Luke 5, different, different thing. But in both cases, there were so many fish, they didn't know what to do at first. They finally got a hold of it and got those fish in. But there were so many, even though they were fishing all night. And the outcome is going to be the same when we trust in Jesus. Uh, you know, lean not, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not upon your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And so that's still the same. The outcome is still going to be the same. I planted, says Paul, Apollos watered. God gave the increase. We don't have control of the increase. That's God's part. But we are to plant and water, plant and water, plant and water. That hasn't changed. That's the mission. The outcome will still be the same. God will give the increase according to his will. Um, don't give up. Don't turn back. Keep on pushing on. You know, God will exceedingly bless us. Again, think of uh, Ephesians 3 and verse 20. Paul writes now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Think about those words he piled up. He is able to do. If it just said God is able to do, that would be enough. But God is able to do exceedingly. If he stopped there, that would be enough. But God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. That's the God we serve. That's the outcome he'll give. I just gave a sermon the other night uh, to a congregation who's thinking about closing their doors. And uh, my text was 2 Kings 18 and 19, where Sennacherib, you know, went through a Syria or went, went down through Samaria, went through all those little villages, came right up to the walls of Jerusalem and sent his envoy over there, almost like a David and almost like Goliath, a Goliath-esque. His envoy, go, envoy goes over there saying, you better submit to Sennacherib and Hezekiah was scared went to Isaiah as I told him Isaiah told him to pray Hezekiah prays and overnight uh, God killed 185,000 of the Assyrian troops and in Isaiah's talking to Hezekiah he said you pray to God and there won't be one shot fired in Jerusalem and there wasn't and I guarantee you Hezekiah had no clue how God was going to deliver him but God delivered him in a way that it's just unimaginable and God can deliver these congregations. He can deliver us if we just trust in him and if we just put, put his word into action in our lives because the outcome will be the same according to God's will. In 2 Peter 1 and verse 4, uh, well, verse 3, in his divine power, he's given us to all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. 
uh, by which uh, we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. The outcome is the same. Serve Jesus. Trust in him. And we must follow, again, God's will. Um, you know, even times of tragedy, times of, of, of despair, times of distress, uh, we still have to trust in God and we still have to ask ourselves, you know, why, why, how, how can we call Jesus our Lord if we're not going to do what he says? And so we have to, to gain our wits back after, after tragedy and some, sometimes acute tragedy, especially. And I just think about the churches and the, and the brethren up in, up in Kentucky recently that kind of had all those tornadoes and so those tornadoes have hit texas and louisiana even even just a couple weeks ago and and th those are acute tragedies and those are those are things that uh we we have to have a solid foundation in god's word to be able to endure and uh and i just want to encourage you brethren you guys have have just encouraged me just hearing the reports and and the ukraine situation be the same thing that 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 you guys who are faithful you're in the trenches you're you're helping people giving aid, whatever it is, uh, Bible studies. I mean, you, you inspire me. Uh, I just get chills up and down my spine talking about it right now uh, because we are, we are together in this and uh, the outcome is going to be the same. God, God, God is going to deliver. He's going to take us through and he will, he will put us on a higher plane at the other side of this thing. If we'll continue to trust in him. And so don't turn back. Number one, Jesus is the same. The mission is the same. And the outcome is the same. Now, just a few things before we close here. Notice that Jesus chose these fishermen. Uh, they made up the majority of his of his apostles. And of course, there's seven of them mentioned here. Now, I don't know to what extent they all did fishing in, in John 21, verse three. But the very fact that they say we're going fishing with you, Peter, tells me that they were probably fishermen, if not fishermen, 100 percent. They were very familiar with it. And so um, fishermen made up a lot of his apostles. And, you know, fishermen have some qualities that I want us to take away from here to help us not to turn back. Number one, they have courage and faith. And uh, these are not recreational fishermen. So, I, you know, let me clear that up right here. But these are like the commercial fishermen. Like, you know, you might watch on the Discovery Channel or a &E, whatever channel it is. Talk about the guys going out, getting the snow crab legs and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it takes courage to go out there in those seas. Of course, we have all the technology today where we can plan it better. We can see storms coming and that kind of thing. But then they didn't have that. And so it was took courage and faith to go out there on that ship or on that boat. Uh, secondly, they had to have patience and faith, patience and faith, like all fishermen do, patience and faith and um, or actually persistence. I meant to say persistence, uh, patience and persistence. And that's what they had. And that's what we have to have to, to endure and not to turn back. Be patient, you know, in your so in your patience, possess ye your souls. Jesus told the disciples in Luke's account of the limited commission. Or actually the destruction of Jerusalem, I believe it was one of those accounts. Uh, but be persistent, be patient. Thirdly, be dedicated and don't quit. Dedicated. Uh, I wonder how dedicated and I know. I know we can allow ourselves to drift. Uh, Hebrews letter epistle warns us of that. We can allow ourselves to drift. And perhaps there's some who have drifted during the COVID um, shutdown. And uh, maybe they need to repent and come back uh, to get back on track. And, you know, in some places, some situations, I can see it's very easy to do to just drift away, especially those small congregations that did not have a live stream, that did not have you know, did not encourage their members to, to find a live stream and to keep informed and to keep encouraged. And, you know, discussion of worship on the live stream, that's a whole nother issue. But I know one thing uh, live stream does do, it encourages people. It encourages people when they hear messages from the word of God. And so don't discount that, but be dedicated and don't quit and then be cooperative and submissive as well. Uh, that's something that fishermen do that all of us can do. Cooperate with one another and submit to God's authority first and foremost. But as Ephesians 5, 21 says, submit yourselves one to another. And then he starts talking about husbands and wives. And so there may be some listening who have been discouraged. And I want to tell you, um, there's all kinds of encouragement from faithful brethren, uh, all kinds of encouragement, this podcast, other podcasts, uh, you know, there, there's ways to be encouraged. I know, I know it can be discouraging. I know that. But there, it can be encouraging as well. And so we would encourage you to, to tap into some of these resources, to tap into some of these 
these these things that will help encourage us. Uh, there may be some here listening who have not put on Christ in baptism, and we offer that opportunity as well. Wherever you are listening, I know there's a Church of Christ nearby. If not, you can communicate with uh, Jonathan here on this on this on this uh, podcast and this website in the comment sections and so forth, and and you can um, you know be encouraged by that as well. And um, you know just find out what you need to do because God wants you. Jesus wants you to be part of His body. We want you to be part of His body, and we'll do everything we can for that to happen. And so uh, please, please. Please find encouragement in that. But whatever we do, let's don't turn back. Keep going and keep faithful and God will see us through. And so let us close with just a brief prayer before Jonathan takes over once again. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the encouragement that we find through your word and through one another. Help us, Father, to all find that encouragement to serve you better each day, be more dedicated each day. And whatever we do, Father, help us not to, to grow weary in well-doing and help us not to turn back. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Brian, appreciate that, man. Uh, we use the word outstanding here a lot. We get people laugh at us a little bit because we come on and say an outstanding job, but it was, brother. Um, very challenging, uh, timely, very timely. We need it. Um, a lot of a lot of discouraged people out there in the church right now um and uh i kind of like what you said i can't remember su such is my attention span these days i can't remember if you said it in the pre-show when we were talking or if you said it in the introduction just about a sense of a renewal going on in some places and, and yes yes and i i think I, I think i'm seeing some of that myself uh the 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 core that is left is is I, I think they're you know as Peter would say in the King James girding up their loins. Mm -hmm. I, most of, most of the brethren I'm in contact with seem like they they there is a resolve and they are resolute to um, to get things moving forward again. And I really uh, I'm encouraged by a lot of the things that I'm seeing. There's obviously there's some there's some dark points. There's some discouragement out there. But uh, I think I see a lot of guys that are just really hopeful and uh, excited about the challenges in front of us. And uh, your message tonight, I know did nothing but encourage that brother. All right. Appreciate you having me. And, and yeah, I mean, don't let the discouragement get you down. I mean, uh, there's so much wonderfulness in the body of Christ uh, congregations. I know, including this podcast, there's a great, uh, great things going on out there and uh, let's get and be part of it and, and be part of the solution. It's there. Well, I don't know if you saw it in the comments or not, but uh, a couple of people really liked your, uh, uh, how'd you phrase it? it? It's not the takedowns, it's the stay downs. That, that That's is right. the problem. Don't stay down. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, there's a good illustration yeah. about, uh, I won't have time to say it, but you can look it up. Doug Williams used to be a quarterback for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and long ago. Mm -hmm. He had a great, mm -hmm. great, uh, great thing about that. Don't stay down. You got to get up. You got to get up. Got to get back up. Yeah. Well, brother, hey, one more time. Uh, website for the School of Preaching. Yes. It's, is. Uh, fsop.net florida school of preaching but fsop.net and again uh you can register for any of the classes uh we have to you have to apply first part-time full-time audit credit and uh, any of those classes are available to anyone online or in person okay well we are glad to know about that and hope, hopefully uh some of our people will look into it and maybe uh, maybe take you up on the offer but um I okay. uh, appreciate you, brother. Thank you for coming on. And uh, I promise it won't be 400 nights, if you're willing. It won't be 400 nights right. uh, before we no, have you back on. Really. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, brother. Okay. Thank you. All right, everybody. Certainly appreciate Brian coming on here tonight. Um, and as we said, just an outstanding job. Great, great lesson. Um, simple, simple outline, simple points to get your head, head wrapped around. I can learn a lot from that. Sometimes I try to be too too complex. Just take the text and, and show what show people what it says. Uh, that power is always in in the words of the text. It's just there every single time. And uh, really appreciate the lesson tonight. You know, a great job. Um, let's turn our attention to um, um, our prayer request. I tried to keep track of as many of them as I could, uh, and. Yes, it's gotten to that point that I need my glasses to read my own writing. That, that's the way it's gone. Um, let's see what we have here. We have uh, Trish. 
I just mentioned that she was not feeling well tonight. And so we'll pray for you, Trish. Glad to do that for you. Hope you will get, get the feeling better. Thank you for tuning in anyway. I saw you didn't comment as much as you said you might not, but uh, hopefully you're still able to be out there and just let, let you know that we all love you and we will certainly pray for you tonight. Um, I'm not sure about the next name. It's either Philippe or Felipe. I'm not sure how we should pronounce that, but he said, he says his mother uh, is a Methodist and he has been trying to uh, study with her and convert her. So he's asking prayers for that. Um, now, the other night, I pronounced this Nita, and Eric pronounced it Netta. I'm not sure which is right, um, but uh, we'll go with Netta because Eric is usually better on names than I am. Uh, we prayed for her, what was it, brother? Um, son, Stephen, not brother, son, Stephen. I just looked at my notes earlier from the 7th when we prayed for, for, her, for him on the 7th. Her son, Stephen. Um, if I remember correctly from my earlier notes, had a heart attack, was on the uh, defibrillator. Um, she says he is off the ventilator now, uh, but has pneumonia. And so um, uh, he says, she, she says he is not doing well. And so we will uh, continue to offer prayers on his behalf. Uh, Claudette is asking us to pray for Carrie, um, that um, Carrie gets some counseling. I didn't give any details. And uh, mindful of that tonight as well. And then Philando is asking us to pray for um, a grandson's grandfather. The grandfather was found unconscious. He's still unconscious and is now uh, in the um, in the hospital. Um, and Connie just put up that she is in Arkansas and they have some tornado warnings there. Um, but she said, yeah, tornado warnings. So she's praying that there's no touchdown uh, near her, um, and so we will pray for that as well. Um, so that's what, that's what I have. Hopefully I didn't miss anything, but if you would, uh, please uh, join me in a word of prayer here together as we start to wrap up the evening tonight. Um, Holy Father, we are, um, as always, just honored to be in front of you this evening, thankful for the opportunity we have to um, give you praise, uh, acknowledge um, our uh, submission to you and to your will. Um, we give you thanks for your son and his uh, lordship over us, uh, secured by the sacrifice and the resurrection he, he went through. Uh, we uh, give you praise and him praise for all that uh, has been done to secure this relationship that we now are blessed to have with you. Um, thankful tonight for Brian, for the good work that he's doing in the kingdom, long years of service and the way that he's um, shepherded the uh, the school of preaching there down there in Lakeland, and uh, we are mindful of, of the good work there. We pray your continued blessings upon it. Thankful for the encouragement tonight uh, for us to re keep our resolve firm, and continue to serve in your kingdom, and we uh, ask your strength to be given to each one of us so that we can um, be empowered to go out and uh, to do that which we have committed to do before you. Tonight we have several that we are going to bring before you uh, in prayer request, and we uh, ask your blessings upon each of them. Uh, Trish is not feeling well, and we hope that she is able to uh, uh, begin to get some relief from that. Uh, we're mindful of uh, Felipe's mother. Um, we pray that uh, her heart can be opened to hear the message of the gospel and that she could be converted. Uh, we're also mindful of Stephen, Netta's son. Um, we pray for um, uh, some kind of recovery for him. Sounds like he's going through a great deal. Uh, and uh, is not doing well, and we pray that that's not uh, uh, going to continue. We ask if it's within your will that he can be healed, healed and begin to get go, get on a good road to recovery. Uh, we don't know the situation in Carrie's life, but we are asking uh, blessings upon uh, Carrie this evening, and uh, that um, Carrie will find the, the help that is needed and, and can begin to work on uh, the problems that are afflicting Carrie. Also mindful tonight of uh, the uh, grandfather of Philando's grandson. Uh, sounds like it's a, a dire type situation. Uh, we hope that uh, a good outcome can come from that. And then of course, we're mindful tonight of Connie and all those who might be in the path of the severe weather that is coming through Arkansas and maybe other parts of the country as well. We pray for safety and all of those things. Obviously not each one of these things, Lord, we, we want the outcome that appears to be the best to us. We want all these people to be, be, be comforted and to be healthy if possible. But we uh, ask these things only under the banner of your will 
And we pray that uh, no matter the outcomes, each person can find a way to bring you glory, even in the midst of hardship. Uh, this evening, we ask your blessings upon Eric as he's away speaking. And we ask your blessings upon Digital Bible Study. And we pray that the, the work here can continue and can continue to grow and uh, bring you glory throughout the, throughout the days that we're here studying your word together. And it's through your son's name that we offer this prayer of thanksgiving and this prayer of petition to you. Amen. Okay, everybody. Um, um, let's turn our attention to the... Uh, uh donations for tonight um by the way I, I think i gave the final number on friday but um if i'm not mistaken the final number was 958 dollars over to the uh nita not netta ah see i was right one time eric was wrong <laughs> uh eric is always better at names than i am but i got that one right so it's nita appreciate that uh thanks thanks for helping me out there i do i, I need that all the time uh there was 958 dollars over the bear valley school of preaching our last week so appreciate that everybody for your generosity um having said that what do we have tonight we have i saw jenny with a 35 dollar super sticker or super chat one or the other over there on youtube and we absolutely appreciate that jenny that is uh uh wonderful thank you very much for doing that um and we have also Give me a second to refresh because Facebook likes me to refresh. Uh, here we go. Let's see what we have. We have um, we have Patsy with 50 stars. Once again, thank you, Patsy. Uh, always reliable. Sobrono, just as reliable there uh, with 50 stars. Thank you much. Pedal, I'm just going to say pedal. I I'm not going to go the Eric Way on pedal, but uh, uh, 100 stars. We do appreciate that pedal. Uh, we've got 200 stars from Alan. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Claudette, uh, again. 200 stars from Claudette. Appreciate that as always. Uh, Sandra, uh, very much appreciate the 200 stars as well. Thank everybody for uh, everything you have done for us tonight. You do for us all the time. Uh, I did see Connie asked earlier in, and I don't know that we've mentioned this in a long time, um, but I thought since she asked the question, it would be good to, to bring it up um, because the the when Eric and I, you know, the first 30 days, you know, 2000, was that nice? I forget my years now. Was it 20? <laughs> was it 19 or 20 when all this started? It had to be 20 when all this started. We did the three hours a night, 30 days for the Connect meeting, and nobody, there was no funding at all. We just turned everything on and did it. We didn't pay the guys who came on anything. We got 90 of them, I think, in the first 30 days, and everybody just pitched in and did it as a volunteer basis. Um, and then we took that little break and then we came back and we decided to just keep on doing it because it was going so well. But uh, one of the discussions Eric and I had about coming back and continuing to do it is we can't keep asking these guys to come back night after night after night. And now some, some of these guys have been on with us 10 or 15 times, like, you know, Robbie and Greg who do the regular slots they've got. Um, so we knew it was only fair that we um, provide some kind of stipend for them when they come on. Um, and it's not a lot. Um, you know, I think we average about, depending on the month, how much funding we get in, we pay them probably 25 to $35 per appearance. Um, you know, the going rate for a lesson like this, if you showed up in person at a church to do a one-time summer series lesson at a reasonably funded church would probably be 100, 150, something like that. So we're still well underpaying them. Um, and, um, we send out checks roughly quarterly. Uh, typically we do it when a guy has appeared two or three times because otherwise I'm writing a whole bunch of checks for a very little amount of money. Uh, but most of the guys, not all of them, but a, a, well, a, a good, I don't know if it's most, a good deal of the guys, I think Scott mentioned it later, a good deal of the guys just say, hey, keep it. And um, when they do that, typically we ask them, okay, where would you like us to send it? And so they'll send it to a, uh, uh, like when Don Blackwell comes on, he sends his to the to GBN, obviously. Um, other guys, you know, if they're Florida School of Preaching grad or a Memphis grad or Bear Valley grad, they may say, hey, just send it over there to that school of preaching. Um, and then we keep a um, a preacher fund available. So we have uh, we don't advertise it because we don't want to get in the business of trying to um, decide who's worthy and who's not. Um, but <coughs> typically if we hear... hear of a preacher having health issues, particularly if he's light on insurance. Uh, we'll mention that to the guys and often they'll donate it back to us to send to some kind of preacher in need. Um, and so over the last two years, um, just through speakers returning their fees back to us, um, 
I think we've sent, I mean, out, outside of the fundraiser weeks we've do we've done, I think we're close between those two funds. I think we're close to about eight to ten thousand dollars we've been able to send back to either schools of preaching or to preachers in need. And understand, again, we have no revenue. We have no income because we don't solicit. We're not a nonprofit. We're not a 501c3. We're not a parachurch organization. We're not a church ministry. It's it's two guys on a website. And so the only funding we have comes from y'all. Um, and um, so that which we're able to do and the w- way that we're able to help support different works and different preachers, um, it's it's entirely up to you. But that is... Uh, that is by far our largest expense um, that that we have every month is is the is the the, the fees that we try to kick back to our uh, uh, to uh, to our speakers. Uh, we feel the labor is worthy of their hire, and we can't just keep asking these guys to come on and, and serve this community without at least offering them something back in return. So that's the process. Uh, it's probably more detail than we've given about it in quite some time, but appreciate the co- question, Connie, because it's, 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 and y'all need to know that what's going on. Um, uh, yes, Connie, we, we do have to, if we turn a profit, we have to pay taxes because we are a, we are in Florida. Uh, we are a private corporation. Um, and that's the downside of the way we're doing it is the things you send us are not, they're not tax deductible because we are not a 501 C three or anything like that. Um, the upside is we don't we have a lot less red tape to, to, to jump through. We can we, we can change and do things a whole lot more nimbly than other people can. So that's the reason we decided to do it the way that we have. But yeah, if we turn a profit as a as a corporation in the state of Florida, we have to pay taxes. So um, just like any other business. So anyway, that that's how we do it, and um, we are able to do it. Thank you once again because y'all a uh, little bit more uh, nuts and bolts tonight kind of conversation. But glad to do it for y'all. If you ever have any questions about how we're running the business here, feel free to let us know. I'll be glad to uh, you know tell you what we can uh, about what's going on here. But um, uh, we do appreciate your um, uh, support, as I said several times already. But it's it's true every time I say it. So. Uh, Having said all that, tomorrow we have, uh, I'll be on tomorrow morning from, from the deep end from 8 to 10 a.m. Uh, Truth Tuesday, I believe, will be on with us um, at the 10 o'clock hour. And um, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think Paul Mays, I think Paul Mays might actually be traveling this week. I don't know if he's going to be on tomorrow, after, excuse me, tomorrow afternoon or not. I think he's traveling for a meeting just like Eric is. Uh, I spoke to him earlier this week and or I messaged him earlier about this week about something else. And he mentioned he was traveling, but he didn't, I didn't think to ask. So I, Paul may or may not be on tomorrow, um, but um, uh, wish him well on where he is. And um, yes, yes, Melissa, I do have a doctor's appointment tomorrow, but I should be able to get my show in before the, uh, before I need to leave. I got to leave right on time, but I should be, I should be able to get the entire show in uh, by 10 o'clock. So um, um and tomorrow night for Connect, guess who we're having? Uh, we are actually having Daryl Broking on with us uh, tomorrow night or Tuesday night. Um, first time I think he's he, – I, I had the thought, you know, uh, about a month ago as I was booking through it, booking through April. Daryl has been on with us 50 times doing his Tuesday morning show and then is, is the show he does by himself later in the week, you know, the 10 o'clock hour during the day. And I don't think we've ever had Daryl on. For the connect meeting so i said hey man come on with us uh and so daryl will be on with us for the connect meeting tomorrow night and then of course thank you connie uh tony uh tony brewer will be on with us for the cogitations blog on um at eight in the eight o'clock hour uh tuesday night as well so full lineup tomorrow looking forward to being able to spend the day with you studying the bible uh thank you all for uh, participating tonight and tuning in again thank thank you brian for coming on and and uh giving us such a good lesson tonight. I will sign off for the evening and we will see you back here, Lord willing, tomorrow morning. So having said all that, as as always, it is my prayer that you will go out and make your day a great one for God. Have a good night, everybody.